Know this? Introducing the original Blood Clad Podcast, not PS. So did Semantic. Special dedication all the way from New York. Boom! Yeah, man, SWOT Semantic. Yeah, man, know. Boom! So did Semantic. Yeah, man, know. Big ups to the man. So did Semantic. On another episode of Soothing Semantics, I'm your host, Rafi Pinsky. Subscribe, like, share, leave a comment. Make sure to smash the like button. And without further ado, on today's episode, we have Justine Goldberg. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> nice to have you. You're a little nervous? Nice to be here. It's nice to have you here as well. Uh, so Justine is a doctor, woman of medicine. Okay, yeah. she's wearing her lab coat. I don't know if you guys kind of put it two and two together, but she uh, has her stethoscope, her her lab coat, uh, student debt, the the stresses of being in medicine. It's hard. It's tough. Um, that's you know I, I didn't do it, but uh, credit to you. So so you're an internist. You internal medicine. You 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 are a doctor at a hospital. Am I missing anything else? Nope, that's it. Any kind of specialties? Um, so I did internal medicine, mm-hmm. and then. People can either choose to do outpatient medicine, which is more like primary care, or go and work in the hospital setting where you're just treating more critical patients. So that's usually called a hospitalist. Okay, and I have a lot of questions, but what has it been like during COVID in Florida? So it's been pretty rough, Mm -hmm. just for most physicians in general. Um, Everyone's clearly been affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, I was running a COVID unit, so it was really rough in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked for a big hospital system, um, but my hospital is a little smaller compared to the rest of our sister hospitals. And I was the only person running the COVID unit at a time. So how many people were in the unit? Patient wise, mm-hmm. usually around 10 to 12 patients. Well, so you were running around and, and everything. So I was having, I had the COVID unit and then I also am in charge of an acute medical floor. So those were non COVID patients, which is what I do even now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm also a consultant for like medicine on a rehab floor, which half my hospital is an acute rehab facility. So and you mean drug rehab specifically? No, no, physical rehab. So this is like mainly for like stroke patients who are, you know, have overcome the stroke, but now need some physical rehabilitation. So sometimes they'll call me to help out with the medicine side of it. So between the COVID unit, the acute medical floor and the rehab, it's pretty busy. Plus, plus admitting from the ER too. Wow. Okay. So let's, let's start with one, the first question. First off, it sounds like you have a lot on your plate. What are your hours like generally? Um, so generally I work 12 hour shifts, Mm -hmm. um, 7 AM to 7 PM. However, just say, you know, the ER gets a ton of a ton of patients that are coming in that need to be admitted to the hospital and they call me before seven. Sometimes I could stay until eight 39. So it could be longer. And definitely during COVID hours, we were working, everybody was really stretching themselves out a lot. So I was doing anywhere from 14 to 16 hour days. And I work seven days in a row usually with seven days off. Wow. Okay. In- including weekends. Okay. So it's seven and seven every, all the time. Most of the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, now you have a bit of a longer break. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's good. I'm sure you're enjoying <laughs> that. You get to finally sleep a little bit. Yeah. So were you dealing with a lot of, and just, I'm going to ask everything. Were you dealing with a lot of deaths during COVID where people just quite frankly, Going, going from the, leaving the world, was that something you were experiencing, experiencing in the ER and in the, in the COVID units? Was that a, a big deal? Because I know obviously Florida, it got hit hard, you know, Florida got hit hard as well, yeah. not just New York. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just in general with being a physician, you're seeing death a lot um, during COVID especially as well. And it got rough for a lot of the physicians because... You know, it's important for us to be supportive to patients and their families, but also to be able to deal with our own emotional aspect behind the scenes. Yeah, that's hard. How do you how do you take it when you come home after a long week? How do you detach? 
your, your, your brain from all that? The first two days of my days off are usually kind of rough. It's very hard to detach. I like to follow up on patients and just see what happened to them. Um, but in terms of deaths and being able to soak it in, everybody processes things differently. I know a lot of physicians were, you know, had a really hard time processing it. Some had to go to therapy. Some, um, for me, I actually have a Facebook, I have a Facebook where I post a lot of things about like health, fitness, and a lot of people were asking me about COVID. And I mean, there's a, there were a lot of things going out on the media that weren't true. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would just write up different posts and people would follow them so that I could try to like educate the public, let them know what's actually really happening behind the scenes. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So it's probably pretty crazy. And, um, so a lot of, a lot of wine bottle, full bottles of wine. <laughs> a couple. Yeah. That's, that's, I don't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I don't get squeamish at all personally. Like I can see the most horrid stuff and I just, I don't know. I've, I've desensitized myself to it. Yeah. But for most people, it's very difficult to see, uh, people in very serious condition physically, you know, if they lose limbs or they have terrible injuries, uh, so that's something that's very difficult for most people to handle to stomach. So cred- credit to you for being able to do that because someone's got to do that. Someone's got to be able to do it. Uh, in, in terms of what you do day to day on your average day, what does a day look like? And, and talk about maybe a day that's more mundane and then tell us more about a day, uh, if you don't mind, a day that was really crazy. You know, someone got shot, uh, whatever it is. This is a podcast. I think many people are wondering. <laughs> Um, Okay, so the cool part about my job is that when I walk into the hospital at 6.45 a.m., I never know how my day is going to be. It's it's not like a typical job where, you know, you have your patients at every hour coming in, you know, like an outpatient medicine or someone else, you know, who's a dentist that has their patients scheduled. For me, it could be anything, you know? So the morning's always like pretty hectic, rushed because a lot of things are happening. You know, um, you're getting a lot of the labs back. You're seeing how patients are, if they're stable or not. Um, I'm checking all my patients from overnight, the overnight admissions that I got. Um, so typically I'll, you know, go into my computer, see how many patients I have, read up about every patient. Um, as the days go on, it gets a lot easier for me because I already know a lot of the patients. Um, nurses are calling me frantic, especially the night nurses, because they're leaving at 7 a.m. They want to just tell me quick things about what happened overnight, you know, kind of clear themselves and then leave. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I typically will see a couple patients beforehand, but at around like 10 30 a.m. is when I round on patients altogether. So the way it is, I don't know if some of these like TV shows show it, but it'll be like me, the nurse manager, the nurse of the patient, the pharmacist, the social worker, and we go from like patient's room to patient room and talk to the patient, see the patient, talk about their plan of care. And in between this, if I have an unstable patient or as they call like a code blue, mm-hmm. they'll like, you know, it'll oversound on the like loudspeaker and everybody like runs to this room and the patient's very unstable, and I'll be the one to run the code. So I'll assess the patient, I'll see what's going on, and I'll be like, okay, let's get an EKG, let's get some vitals on the patient, which means like blood pressure, how's their breathing, try to figure out why is the patient crashing, and try to resuscitate the patient. And um, I'll definitely say that's probably one of the coolest things about my job is being able to save lives. And it's not just me, it's coming with like God's help. Um, But bringing a patient back to life is just so rewarding and just so emotional at the same time. And I think that's what keeps me on my toes in terms of studying more, trying to educate myself more. And because I'm really studying for a bigger purpose of saving other people's lives. Yeah, I can't imagine something more rewarding than that. I really can't. Yeah. Well, really, what's trippy about it is that, and it kind of going off into a rabbit hole here is, you think about Ukraine and Russia, and the fact that people are essentially killing each other, and then you have the doctors in Ukraine who have to save people. Yeah. And it's this, it's the circle of life, and it kind of, kind of sucks. But then again, 
we need doctors for that reason. But it's kind of crazy how this this cycle happens where you, especially in a war in a country at war, there probably aren't nearly enough doctors to handle all this. So, yeah, I mean, that's just I'm just you know I'm processing it. I'm kind of yeah. picturing it in my mind. What what would you say is your your top most intense story, or maybe your top three, if you don't mind sharing something that something that made you at the end of the day want to down three bottles of wine? I mean, it's hard to pick out one story. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more just it's more just like the culmination of everything combined, you know, because. Things don't just like happen. Okay, at this time you're gonna do this. This time, usually you're just like multitasking, which makes life stressful for most people. Mm-hmm. Um, patients are crashing. You have to stop what you're doing. Another patient's you know demanding your time for something else. Um, sometimes if you have multiple patients that are unstable at the same time, that can be really really stressful because you pretty much have to manage your time in terms of trying to save that person while you have another person who's also really unstable. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's kind of, it's kind of like hard to say, um, to me, honestly, what makes things so hard and like emotional and like crazy is the connections you build with patients and then just seeing the patient either like not make it or trying to talk to the families. I think the hardest part is giving bad news to patients. Oh, that's a good, that's a very good topic. How do you, how do you do that? Well, bad news to patients and bad news to their families. Yeah. So let's start with the bad news to the patients. If God forbid a patient has cancer, God forbid a patient has to, have you ever done with amputations? Is that a thing? Yeah, so, okay, that, so that's the cool thing about internal medicine is we deal with stroke patients, congestive heart failure, respiratory issues like all the smokers with their lung issues um covid um infectious disease diabetic ulcers amputations pretty much everything except pediatrics and pregnant ladies so we deal with all the rest everything else yeah okay so how do you tell somebody have you done that have you been in a situation where someone had to lose a leg and you had to break the news to them yeah so So the one thing that I really do is I try not to sugarcoat things. I'm not blunt, but I think what I try to do is I try to sit down with the patient. I like to explain to them what is going on with their body, the system, you know, maybe how they got to that point. And I really try to educate the patient. And I think by educating a patient instead of just telling someone what they must do, really help someone to be able to make that decision. So as a physician, we're not the ones making the decisions for the patients. We're there to try to guide them Mm -hmm. and give them all the benefits and risks of what they're about to like go through. So, so, so for example, I had a patient that came in on a Saturday, maybe at six o'clock PM. And he came in with this like really, really nasty looking wound on his leg. You know, I did imaging of his leg. Do you know how he got it? Huh? Do you know how he got the wound? Yeah, so uh, he was diabetic. I had, I, that was what I was also going to ask you, if, if you find more amputations from diabetes or from injuries. Mostly diabetes. Hmm. And a lot of the time is because patients don't have sensation as their diabetes get worse or like not so controlled. They don't have sensation, so a little ulcer they don't feel so it can just grow very very fast they don't don't see it well they a lot of diabetic patients are supposed to check their feet daily Mm -hmm. you know because if they wear tight shoes like me or you we're gonna be able to feel when we get pain or an ulcer but they don't have sensation down there they take their shoes off they can't see their feet that's what people are supposed to do (laughs) so sometimes or they'll say you know i had this and you know, I was just waiting for it to get better and it just kept getting worse. A lot of the time, like this, this patient that came in had it for about a month and then I did imaging on this and it also had some really, really foul smell to it. As I don't mean to be like gross, but this is all part Talk of the physical it. exam. I, the smell, <laughs> you know, it's funny, the smell is, is a lot worse for me than the actual look of it. Yeah. Like I can, I re- I can look at anything. It's yeah. great, I don't know, I just, I'm, I might even, I might, it's never happened. I might puke if it was in person, but I'm not going to run away and be like, oh my God, I can't see that. Initially, it would definitely 
shock me. But then I would say, okay, the, my fascination for it takes over my yeah. discomfort. So if, but it's good though, because in an environment where something happens, I, I won't, I know I'm not going to like run away from the situation. I can, I can deal with it. So it's yeah. good. Okay. So back to you, the, um, the word. back to you, Justine. <laughs> okay. So the, um, so the amputation. So what was the conversation that you, that you had to have? This is, I've always wondered this, by the way, I never asked a doctor. I've always been thinking of this. Um, so I did imaging. Well, first of all, I definitely knew it was a pretty bad infection just from the way it looked, the way it smelled. Mm -hmm. I did imaging and it showed that he had gas under there. So what's called, it's called gas gangrene, which is probably one of the worst infections someone can get in their leg. And this is infection, actual gas, I know gang gangrene, I know is, a, is like an infected, infected kind of, is it a fluid? Is it a, it's not, no, a germ? So gangrene is basically, it's, it's dead tissue. Mm -hmm. So, and this spreads like wildfire. It's just, it's, it's, it's actually considered an emergency where I had to call in, um, the operating room team on the weekend to come in and this guy needed an amputation, um, uh, before it would spread higher and higher and higher. So basically it'll spread to the point where it'll just kill him. Mm -hmm. Like they have to, you have to cut yeah. off the source or else it's just, yeah. Phew. It's like a fire pretty much oh underneath. Oh my God. And are there times where it literally spreads to the whole person's body? Like they just. It could. You find them in a house and everything's just. Yeah. I mean, there are people that die from that. I, I know someone, actually a toddler, I know, where he lost his limbs all from gangrene. But how did, they, how did he get the gangrene in the first place? Sometimes, sometimes people, it starts from infection, lack of care, you know not having what were the parents what happened with the parents it's hard to say okay but yeah in terms of my patient so i saw this um in this in this scenario i told him exactly what was going on i told him you know if you want to just stay here and be on iv antibiotics that's one option however the best option would be amputation before this spreads faster and we learned in medical school that having gangrene is an emergency. So I called in the operating room team right away. They took, he was in the operating room within the same hour and he couldn't stop thanking me for saving his life. Yeah. I mean, I imagine so. Oh my God. But, yeah. but, you, but you still had, how, how much of the leg did you take off? The um, knee, the entire thing? He actually needed it below the knee. So, wow. Yeah. And he just said, he, hey, do it. I mean, he didn't really have a choice, but he just said, yeah, do it. Yeah. God, that's such a challenging thing to 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 have like such a, yeah. a decision to have to make like that on the spot i mean yeah it's a no-brainer unfortunately it's like i'd rather lose my leg than die but you know that you're gonna wake up without a leg that's a hard thing to deal with yeah it's really hard i mean for me i really try to i, I treat most of my patients as my family mm -hmm. and i really try to educate them and try to come to a decision together. I never want to feel like I'm telling them what to do or, you know, to be dictator like because mm. I don't think that really helps to have a good doctor patient relationship. And so you don't want to come in with a machete and just start chopping legs. <laughs> when you were used to be in the cartel. Um but the yeah, dark humor. The the um um, I just had a, I had a question. I lost my train of thought, but there are plenty more in terms of death. Cause these are questions I want to know yeah. okay? and feel free. If you don't want to answer something, just let me know. Uh, how do you go about that? If somebody passes first off, do you sometimes feel the guilt of God, maybe I could have done something. And also have you had like families who are just so emotional that they just have to blame somebody. So they blame it on you or someone else. Um, and also again, how do you kind of deliver that, that news to people? So I will say, um, one of the top topics that most physicians do not feel comfortable as in, we don't feel that we got enough education in medical school is how to give bad news. And it definitely takes practice. And I think it's a combination of being compassionate, being understanding education and um, making sure the family's comfortable. So this started for me day one when I was an intern in residency, my first day in ICU. 
um, which is an intensive care unit. I had a patient who was 35 years old. He was brain dead. And I had 20 family members standing around the patient and they wanted me to show them how he was brain dead. And I was an intern. This was my first day in ICU. And um, that was the most scary part for me in terms of just being like thrown into it. But as time goes on, you learn how to deliver bad news. So for me, the best thing to do, which I just had to do this my last week on that I worked, um, I had two, two patients that came in with cancer. That was a new diagnosis. And um, I basically just sat down with the family and I explained to were them. Were they young patients? Um, they were around 60 years old. Mm. And I sat down with the family and explained to them my exact thought process of how the patient presented, you know, why I did certain tests, what I found, and how to go about it from there. And um, delivering bad news is always really hard. Um, I used to get very emotional in the very beginning, but um, as time went on, I had to learn that I had to be strong for the patients. And then when I get home from work, that's kind of when you know, I tried to like process it on my own. But um, I recently had probably one of the most, um, how do I even say this? Like one of the most like career changing experiences two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. For some reason, people think that well, like when I'm a doctor, they can just like ask me like whatever. So someone approached me and they're like, listen, my family member has been having, you know, this pain. Can you talk to them? And I'm like, sure. I talked to the family member. And after asking a couple questions about this lady, mm -hmm. um, my gut feeling was, I bet you this lady has cancer. And I- What did you, what did you, how'd you know that? I just, I just had a gut feeling. Like just from the way she was describing her pain, mm -hmm. how long it had been. Um, she wasn't eating so much. She had weight loss with it. And um, I just said like, you need to really go see a doctor. Like, this is super important. But then again, you also don't want to scare someone because you don't know for sure, you know? And um, I even spoke to the family about it and I said, you really should follow up on this. And the patient came in. Um, the patient came into the hospital and I saw that the patient came to the ER. I was kind of like watching the ER doctor and working mm -hmm. up the patient. And he was going to send the patient home. And I went, up to the, I went up to him and I was like, hey, like, I know this patient. Would you mind if I like admit this patient? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, sure. I didn't know that. And I admit this patient. And um, after doing like a colonoscopy and endoscopy um, and some further imaging, I found the patient had cancer with stage four. Oh, man. And, you know, to another patient who you don't know, it's very different. Yes, it's super emotional, but having to deliver to someone who I'm close to or someone who I know, it was just, it was like even more like devastating. It was probably one of the most like emotional days for me that I've had in a really long time because having to deliver it, trying to be there for them and stage four is, you know, really difficult. So the person passed? No, 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 no. The person's still alive and is going through treatment. Well, how, have they come a long way or are they a lot better? Well, it's only, it's pretty recent, so yeah. How do the, I mean, how do you know, how do the stages work? Like stage four, what's the probability with a certain cancer, with the cancer they had, for instance, at stage four, what's the probability they'll survive? So obviously like the earlier the stage, the better it is. But um, the way we learn staging is depending how if it's in the lymph nodes, if it's crosses certain parts of the body, um, you know, like upper or lower, it also depends on different cancers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's hard to say, and that's why oncology is so difficult. But, um, and I really don't like it when patients ask me prognosis questions because it's hard to say, you know, like no one really truly knows, you know, just because we see this so much doesn't mean, you know, there are chances that people survive. So I always try to give my patients hope. I don't sugarcoat things, but I'll say, listen, like it, it doesn't look so great. However, there are always miracles and I've seen miracles. I guess that's the most honest way to say it. Yeah. 
because you also don't want to put you know you don't want to say something that isn't true oh god that's hard yeah it's really hard <laughs> like i'm in real estate you know i just my my worst thing is sorry you didn't get the property you know what i mean like <laughs> you're not approved for financing you know perspective is very important so for all of you out there who are agents most people who have jobs um you, you usually don't have to deliver bad news like she does like justine does so uh yeah, it's really it's really all about perspective. That's why it's so important that the right people are in the right fields. Mm-hmm. But God, that's tough. I, I I feel like I would be able to build myself up to that, but there is no way it would be easy. Can't imagine it's easy for anyone. You can't be if you have any sort of heart whatsoever. It's got to be so challenging, and I'm sure it doesn't it doesn't get any easier. You just mm-hmm. kind of. You, you you know that it has to be done and you you do your best yeah it's yeah. really tough wow okay so are are there any th- intentions do you have any intentions of maybe uh, uh adding something to your repertoire or changing paths in any way are there any sort of things that you're still trying to learn any kind of courses or yeah so um i really like doing procedures and um what kind of procedures? So in um, residency, I used to do a lot of procedures in the ICU. You know, either taking fluid out of the abdomen, it's called a paracentesis, a thoracentesis, draining fluid from lungs, mm-hmm. um, putting in certain lines, like um, if a patient needs certain antibiotics or certain medications to resuscitate a patient, um, we use certain lines called like a central line, which goes um, from the side of your neck all the way down to your heart. So it's like direct access. Um, however, in my job, they do not allow me to do procedures. They just, they, they said like your insur- our insurance like doesn't cover us to do that and malpractice and all that. Um, so I'm trying to find, I'm trying to start my own business also where it's gonna be like cosmetics, weight loss, trying to get people more into like the health and fitness world. Um, are, you, are you trying to pivot out of what you're doing to that? Or are you just trying to do that as well? Do that as well. Okay. Yeah. So how are you, you going to have any time for yourself? You're going to be working 24 hours a day? <laughs> well, I really like, honestly, I love what I do. And and I think that is the key to anybody in any field. Oh, you yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. I it's, just spoke about that on my last episode with somebody. You should check this yeah. one out, by the way. It's yeah. A, it's a great one. Yeah, yeah. If, but, you, if you truly love what you do, it makes your days so much better. Because for me, I actually, as crazy as it sounds, I look forward to starting my week. You know, too, I'm like, yeah. I'm like antsy. I'm ready to go. I can't wait to interact with patients. I love the challenge of medicine. I love it's, it's kind of like being an FBI agent, but for the body is the way it How is. So? so for example, like this patient that came in right with cancer, like I had to work backwards. Like I saw the CT scan, but a CT doesn't show, okay, this is cancer. You know, you see certain things, you work backwards. You try to figure out why the body's like that, you know? I mean, obviously, the best is if your if the patient can tell you if they're a good a good historian. As by we the say. way, I just had a total trip moment, and I why do I feel like you were related to them? Holy shit! Do you have any family in Brooklyn? No. Because I know Gavi Goldberg and jo- Joseph Goldberg. Shout out to you guys, and they're also they're also gingers, and they 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 kind of you guys kind of look alike. I was like, if you would have said they're you guys are cousins, I would have been at such a like crazy moment. Yeah. Okay, you're not. Not, do do not from Brooklyn. I'm from South Africa. Okay. Johannesburg, South Africa. Africa. Except when you said scenario. Did I say scenario? Sen- scenario. Scenario. You said it normally, but it just... I say scenario, you say scenario. Um, but yeah, okay. So that's awesome. So you, you, you want to add something to what you're doing, and you look forward to work. I look forward to work as well. It's a shame that most people don't. But yeah, I mean, it's it's night and day when you do something you enjoy. Because even if it's challenging, there's a fo- there's a why to it. You aren't mm-hmm. just doing it because someone told you to. There's a deep reason behind what you're doing and yeah. you purpose in it. It's like the the tough part is a lot of people don't even know what their purpose is. Yeah. So even even it, then, when you find it, it's the question of being willing to jump into it. So if somebody was an accountant for twenty years, because let's be honest, nobody actually likes accounting. <laughs> Uh, and some people are like, yes, I do. No, you don't. Okay. Like every friend I have that does accounting want, either got out of it or wants to get out of it. We still need you guys, though. We still need you guys. Um, but uh, that's another thing is people who have been doing something, a corporate job for 20 years, and now they want to p- 
pivot and do something they love. They want to be an alligator uh, groomer. Okay, it's a real job, as far as I know. Could be, might be. They can't pivot out because they're afraid and they have commitments and a family and all that. So uh, it's awesome that you went and did what you wanted to do and you're still doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Yeah. I mean, med school was rough. It was super rough. And in order for anybody to get through it, you have to have something burning inside of you. Like for me, it was one of my dreams was to become a physician and really to treat patients and save lives and make a difference in this world. And besides that, I just love the challenge of medicine, which is really, really cool. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. Well, Justine, Dr. Dr. Goldberg, how, how has it been with COVID and countless patients? The, the uh, additional hours you've probably done, how do you do? How do you deal with it mentally? Uh, have you experienced burnout? Have you, have you gone to the liquor store day after day and the, the guy working behind the counter said, Dr. Goldberg, we, we're out of stock. Has that happened? No, actually, most of you. I, and mo- do you have a second location? <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, most of you in Aventura may have seen me running. I run a lot. That's good. Um, for me, that's how I process my burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me tell you all, the burnout is real. It, it really, really is. Um, even last year, I was actually just like doing my taxes. So all from last year, I pretty much worked full time and a half because on my weeks off, many other physicians were calling me being like, hey, can you help cover? Can you come do a couple extra shifts in our hospital? We'll pay you like, they tried to even like entice us, like we'll pay you premium hour, we'll pay you extra bonus for shifts. And, um, you know, in the beginning it was cool, right? I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to go help other people. I'm going to go see more patients. It's going to be great. And I was doing a lot. Like I would pretty much work four or five extra shifts out of my weeks off. So, which is even crazier because now I'm working like, I don't know, 13, 14 days in a row and taking like three, four days off and then going back to my week on. And, um, it was just like seeing like straight COVID patients, like every patient when I'd go help out at other hospitals. And it's like the same thing over and over again, like patients having trouble breathing and like you're doing a lot of the same treatments over and over and patients were getting better, Mm -hmm. but um, just seeing seeing it over and over again and going and like waking up and you're going to do all these extra shifts. And even for me, like in my hospital where I do so much, it, it just, it would get to a point where it's like running a marathon and you're like the last hundred meters of the race. So for me, I'm a marathon runner and I know, I know what that feels like. You know, it's like your, your leg, you're pushing so hard to the finish line. You're trying to get the time you want. You don't feel your legs anymore. And it's just like, you want to keep going. And it's pretty much like mind over body at this point. And that's pretty much how it is like during COVID. And so even now, a lot of the physicians, Towards the end of COVID, I mean, COVID's like what people say, like it's almost over. Mm -hmm. But this last round that we had, these bonuses, premium hours, it's like not enticing anymore because everyone is just completely burnt out, including the specialists too. You know, they're just, they're tired. Everybody's just like super tired. And um, I mean, we also like lost a couple of physicians to COVID. Oh man. Which is rough. Um, But... Yeah, the burnout is real, for sure. So how do you handle it? What do you do? How do you really cope with it? For me, I try to exercise a lot. I run. Well, you mentioned the running. Yeah. I'm, yeah. But, I'm, but okay. in terms of like coping at work, it's kind of, for me personally, I've had to learn how to set boundaries for myself. Because most of the time I'm like, it's okay, I can take another patient. I can keep doing this, you know? but you realize that you just get exhausted over time, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of physicians now are just like exhausted because we've been overworked for the past like two years. And um, yeah, it's it's a struggle for everybody. Sounds like it, do you have any people that, do you have any doctors that are done with it? They just switch careers, they get out? So I noticed a lot of actually the older physicians, they retired like right when COVID hit because they were just like, we can't handle this much more. A lot of older physicians retired. I, I can't say I blame them. Yeah. 
Oh, that's super challenging. Okay. So, Madame, is there any, any, are there any other things you, you'd maybe like me to ask or, or you'd like to talk about? Okay. Well, it has been a pleasure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, subscribe. Actually, subscribe. Take two seconds. You're watching my videos. Just hit the subscribe button. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. Anyone who is supportive, I thank you from the bottom, bottom of my heart. It really means a ton. I put a lot of work into this project. So if you could really take a quick second, hit the subscribe button. The likes also help the algorithm. Comments help the algorithm. Uh, you know, if you're a friend and supporter, show your support. It would really mean a lot to me. And again, Justine, thank you so much for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it. I, uh, I'm, I'm now a lot more educated on what it's like to be a doctor during COVID and what it's like to be a doctor in general at a hospital. So uh, thank you for that. Very educational. And I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed. Until next time.